Okay, yeah. So there are two cross ratios, two independent cross ratios at four points, U and V. And we said that if we expand the correlator into in perturbation theory, at one loop, this is the only object that can write down, there's one integral. At two loops, there's also one integral and its rotation by 90 degrees. And those are known, they were computed by David Javinus Yukina in terms of dialogues and logs. Remember that they are maximally and uniformly transcendental, as people say. So the sum of the weights here is always 2L. So this 2L minus R plus R gives you always 2L. And if you go to three loops, you get four integrals plus their rotations. This one, which is the generalization of what we had at one and two loops, to the tennis court, which can actually be shown to be related to this one, it's actually, well, the same up to the overall factor, and then two new integrals. And so the question is, how can we get these integrals? And, well, we stopped yesterday roughly at that point. And so the basic idea is, that's what I'm trying to illustrate, so how can you use all these techniques that I introduced in the previous lectures to basically come up with some kind of unique answer? So you construct an ansatz, and in the end you basically get a unique function that satisfies all the constraints. And that will be the answer. Okay? And well, the first thing I need to know in order to construct such an ansatz is what kind of functions do I use? Okay? Otherwise, I cannot even start. Now, given that we know the one and two loop answers here, and they were polylogs. Well, you can make an assumption, but I stress that it is an assumption, which you then, in the end, well, if you find a solution, a unique function that matches all the constraints, that is the solution. But in the end, you make an assumption that it's polylogs for now. Okay? And you make another assumption, because it's equal for super young males. You say that they have uniform and maximal weight. Okay? At L loops, you expect only to find functions of weight to L. But that is an assumption. Now, then comes the question, which polylogs? Okay? And yesterday we already said, okay, if I look at the integrals that I know, integrals of the same type that I know, then if I look at its kind of image in the Hopf algebra, or its symbol, if you want, I can note that the symbol is only made up of four objects. There's this variable x and this variable x bar, and in the symbol I only find these four possible letters. Okay? So there's kind of an imprint of my function space. Okay? So I can make another assumption. which is now, in some sense, stronger than what before, I can say that the alphabet is x, x bar, 1 minus x, 1 minus x bar. OK? And the other thing we already discussed yesterday is we know that these things are Feynman integrals, so they have well, well, they have precise cuts. The cuts must be at posi uh, points where Mandel's sum invariance vanish. In this case, Mandel's sum invariance means distances between two points. And by conformal invariance, that means that the first entry can only be a cross ratio. 
Okay? And if you remember the definition of u and v a few slides back, that means it's saying that u and v are the first entries, means that the first entries cannot be anything, but they must be combinations of x times x bar and 1 minus x, 1 minus x bar. Okay? So now I can ask, can I construct all the functions that have that satisfy this? Okay? At weight one, let me do weight one and weight two on the board. Let you see how what the general idea is. And weight one, well, there are only two objects I can write down manifestly. It's this one. This one. That's all there is. Okay? There is only one. It's weight one, so there is only one entry, and the first entry must be x x bar, one minus x, one minus x bar. So now at weight two, I can say, okay, well, if my assumption is true, then what could be the most general symbol I can write down? So I now go backwards and say, okay, let's assume. I have decomposed my polylogs in the maximal way, so they're just tensor products of weight one. The most general thing I could write down would look like that. X bar, three, x, x bar. So one minus x plus c four, x, x bar, and so 1 minus x bar. And the same when I have here 1 minus x, 1 minus x bar, and so on. Okay? The first entity must be x, x bar. The second one must be 1 minus x, 1 minus x bar. With some free coefficient ci, that's the most general thing I can write down. Okay? That has, that satisfies my assumptions. Okay? So, are there any functions that would match such a thing? Well, for this, you first have to answer another question, which is, if I write down the most general possible tensor, will there be a function? Okay? So far, we have only always started from the function, and we said, okay, we can decompose into a tensor. But now there's also the inverse question. If I give you a random tensor, can you always find a function? And the answer is no. There's a condition, it's called the integrability condition. Which is necessary and sufficient. Tells if you take a tensor, a random tensor, Okay, could be well something like this. Well, let's even look at something more general. So a random tensor would be something of the following type. For some values, these are rational numbers, and these are tensors. Okay, the C's are the coefficients. Okay. Yeah. Then this thing is the tense, the symbol of a function, if and only if this is, well, let's call this thing omega, then there is a function f such that the symbol of f is precisely this omega, if and only if. The following identity holds. I, let's call it I, well, I L minus one omega. Let me write it and then I'll tell you what it means. It's actually very easy to remember. Omega I. L, which 
d log omega i l plus 1, and all this must be 0. So if you take a random tensor, you can find a function whose symbol is this tensor if and only if. Whenever you take out two consecutive tensors, say the one in the first position and the second position, and you replace them by the wedge product of the corresponding d logs of these objects, you get zero. And you have to do that for the first, second entry, second, third, third, fourth, and so on. Okay? So it's a very strong statement. In particular, it's both directions. Okay? So that means in order to get a function, I have here eight free coefficients. I have to impose that whenever I write d log of this, which d log of that, plus c2, d log of this, which d log of that, and so on, I must find zero. So my c's are not all independent. Okay? And well, you can work out what that is. It's very easy in this case. You find that the solution space that you get is four-dimensional. It contains the following four objects. XX bar tends uh, XX bar. Obviously, if I put a wedge in between, I get zero. So that by itself is good. And the same for this guy. Because this is symmetric. When I put a wedge, I get zero immediately. Then there's the other symmetric. Term I can write down. Let me write it plus. Spa, so that is symmetric. So when I put a wedge, I find zero. But there's another solution. Let me. Just so make sure to get the signs right. This plus 1 minus x, 1 minus x bar, tensored with, where is it? x bar divided by x. Okay? So those four objects, linear combinations of those four objects, are the most general thing that satisfy this condition. And if this theorem here is true, then each of these objects represents a function. Okay? Now, this guy, you can easily convince yourself, represents the log of x, x bar squared. It's a factor one half if you put the right normalization. In the same th way, this guy represents log square 1 minus x, 1 minus x bar. And this guy here represents log x, x bar, log 1 minus x, 1 minus x bar. Okay? That is not a big surprise. Of course, I had these objects at weight 1. At weight 2, I must find all products of weight 1. Okay? That's not a big surprise. But then there's a fourth solution, which, after a bit of inspection, looks like this. That's a dialog. Sorry. It's a dialog of x minus this dialog of x bar plus one half log x x bar log one minus x one minus x bar. For the experts, it's a block Wigner dialog up to some overall factor. Okay? So that means that the most general thing of way two, meaning one loop, can only be a linear combination of these four objects. If my original assumption is true. Of course, if my original assumption that it's polylogs with this alphabet is wrong, then of course it can never work. 
Okay. Now, if I tell you that this function here is a block Wigner dialog, maybe some people notice that these functions are something very special. Because let me assume that x, and x is complex. x and x bar complex conjugate. And let me compute the monodromy around x equals 0. Okay? But then x and x bar pick up a face that is just opposite. Okay? And remember that this continuity is only talked to the leftmost factors in my co-product, so they will only talk to the first one. I mean, remember this is a log x and this is log x bar. So if I take the monotony on zero, this one picks up a phase of 2 pi i, but x bar will pick up a phase of minus 2 pi i, and the discontinuities don't talk to the other factors, so they will precisely cancel. Okay? And you can easily convince yourself that the same happens with by this term. Anyhow, there's no discontinuity around zero. And discontinuities around one will be up, the, the other way around. This term has discontinuities around one, but it will cancel. And this term has no discontinuities around one. There's not a discontinuity in principle, which lies at infinity. You can easily check it's the same. There is no other discontinuity because there are no other singularities. The only singularities are at zero, at one, and off at infinity. So the conclusion is that if my assumption that each thing is polylogs is correct, then the Landau equations imply that this function, seen as a function of the complex variable x, has no discontinuities. Okay? It's a very strong statement. And don't get it wrong. I'm not saying the correlator has no discontinuities. It's uh, in order for the correlator to have the correct discontinuities, this function cannot have discontinuities. If you think about it, it's a bit uh, weird. Okay? So in other words, the function I'm looking for is actually a single-valued function. Now, it turns out that these functions have been classified by mathematicians completely. There's an algorithm that gives you all these functions. So actually, this problem that I set out to solve is solved in the mass literature. There's a classification of all these functions that I wanted to construct. So, but let's then try to get to the one loop. So what could I do with one loop? Let me keep this. So, at one loop, we said this is the, the object. Okay, this is the integration point, this is the four external points. If this is correct, then this and if we assume it's n equals four, it's uniform and maxi transcendental, so way two. This thing, let me call this object here L2, the object is L1 squared is a factor one half. This object is one half L0 squared. And this object I call it L0, L1. Can only be a linear combination of L2, L1 squared, L0 squared, and L0, L1. Now, what are the coefficients? Well, the first thing you can note is that, I'm oh, sorry, and there's a one here, obviously. There's actually still some symmetry that I didn't impose. Okay, it's already quite good. I, only, I started off with an integral, and I tell you, it can only be a linear combination of four functions. Now I'm telling you, well, it's actually more constrained, because this thing has a symmetry. Okay, this thing is, has an S4 symmetry. Obviously. I can exchange the points any way I like, I will always get to the same graph. This implies, I guess many people know that, 
in S3 symmetry on X, seen as one complex variable. Namely, the orbit of the symmetry is X, 1 minus X, X over X minus 1, and the inverses. Sorry? Sorry? The coefficient is in B and L is one half. Yeah? Because I normalize it here with one half. But I could absorb the one half into the B. Okay. Okay, so there's a symmetry. So I have to impose that this thing here is totally symmetric. Okay? If you do that, you will get some constraints among the bees. I'm not going to tell you which ones. There's actually a stronger symmetry that kills all coefficients but one. So what is the other symmetry that we haven't imposed yet? There's one symmetry which is H3, but there's another one. It's actually a symmetry that is not visible in the graph. When you look at the space of functions, that the space of functions carries another symmetry, which is Z2, which is just exchanging Z and Z bar. Okay? And you can see that this function is even, even, even this function is odd. Okay? So, this object must be even. Okay? Because this object is real. This, this Z2 symmetry is complex conjugation, if you like, between quotation marks, not quite. This object is real, so this thing must be even under the C2 symmetry. Now, you would now say, okay, well, then the odd, odd guy cannot appear. That is actually wrong. Exactly. If A transforms in the right way, then actually it can appear. Okay? So, how can I decide? What is then the transformation property? Well, I told you already yesterday, very briefly, that actually these things could be rational functions in principle. And those rational functions are related to, well, let's call it cuts of my integral, maximal cuts. Not quite, it will be more precise, but roughly speaking, if I cut all the propagators, that's taking this morally, okay? That's taking discontinuities, if we take enough of them, the polylogs all die. Now, taking enough cuts is a bit, well, let's be more precise, just than taking enough cuts. The correct statement is, this is my integral, and note that I put the same n here than down here, which in our case is indeed satisfied. Then, taking enough cuts, so take, putting enough propagates on shell, actually means I take the residue of this thing. Okay. In order to compute that, well, you have to go to some book of algebraic geometry, and we'll tell you that actually the way to do that is what you're looking for is what is called the global pole, meaning that you're looking for a point X, not, which is a simultaneous zero of all propagators, so they're simultaneously all shell. And in order to compute it, what algebraic geometry tells you is, well, change coordinates such that the polynomials are my coordinates, then, of course, well, I get a Jacobian, okay? It's a Jacobian of this change of coordinates. And then, for this object, they know how to compute the residue, because it's now completely factorized. Okay, just the residue at the point x naught is now precisely this object evaluated at p equals zero, because that's precisely the point x naught. Okay? Well, in our case, we know what the PIs are. Those are, those are our propagators. Okay? So they're now the same for in, the, in the case that we have. The polynomials in the denominator are the propagators. I change coordinates from xi p squared, xi5 squared, sorry, to pi. x5 is the integration point. 
I can compute the Jacobian, excuse me, determinant. And it turns out that the residue is actually this. There's only one possible residue, and it's given by that. And if you compare what we had in the known answer, you see that it's indeed what sits out front here. Okay? But even if I hadn't known that, I could have found it. Okay? It was a bit quick, but it's basically just computing residues in many variables. But this tells you that actually the coefficients in front of the polylogs, they are odd functions. Okay? The residue is an odd function, which means that if, well, there's, you see that there's only one, so they must all have the same. Well, yeah, let's say like this. This whole thing is actually like that. And now A, B, C, D are numbers. Okay, I say that this is the only residue that is left, so these guys cannot depend on X anymore. This thing is odd, this thing is even, so I must have A, it must have B equals C equals D equals zero. Okay? So I conclude there's only a unique answer up to overall normalization. Okay? Now, to get the overall normalization, of course, you have to compute the function at one point or something, but at least you get basically the whole thing. It's completely unique. Note that this tells you something more. It's consistent to check. I told you there's an H3 symmetry as well. This means that this guy must be, well, transform in such a way as to compensate transformation of this thing, and indeed that's true. Okay? So the idea is now that you can go to higher loops in exactly the same way. You have to construct these spaces. As I said, in the case that I set out to do, that was done by mathematicians. You have to convince yourself what are the rational functions that sit in front, or algebraic, depending on what formatization you choose. And then you try to constrain them. Okay? You can't constrain them by some internal symmetries, like this S3 symmetry that is just the symmetry of the graph. And then there's also some internal type of symmetry. And, well, here, this was enough to fix it up to some overall normalization. I so said, then you need to know something more. That's physical input. In practice, what you can use is, say, some limit of your integral. Call it OPE type of thing. You know how to compute these objects in some way, in some limit. And that fixes you the remaining coefficients. OK? Now, let's try to do that for our three-loop cases. These two integrals that we didn't know for the three-loop correlator. I mean, everything I said is still true. So there will be a symmetry. It will not be F3 because the graph is more complicated. There will be this Z2 symmetry. It will be three loops, so we need functions of weight six. But mathematicians gave them to us. We need the residues. And I will show them to you in a second. And we need some physical input to fix the remaining overall normalization and maybe some relative normalizations if we have, we have more free parameters. That can be done. For example, this is one of these integrals. You can, for example, compute what happens. Well, let me go to the graph. It's probably easier to see from there. Uh, here we are. You can, for example, compute what happens when this point gets very close to this point. There are ways to compute, actually, the asymptotics of the integral when these two points get very close. Okay. In Euclidean space. Okay. You could do something similar. could think of doing something similar when they're light like separated. That's not what I'm doing. I'm saying there, there's uh, ways to get the behavior when these points are close in Euclidean space. Okay. And then you get something like that. 
Because you can check actually that these points being close means that either x or x bar, they were now no longer complex conjugate to each other, but they are decoupled and one of them vanishes or goes to one. For example, x bar might vanish, but then there's still a function of x left over. And you see here there's a remnant, which is one over x, which is a remnant of something like, like this, when x bar goes to zero. Okay, and you also see that this thing here has a log, which is weight one, and all the rest is weight six, and it's only polylogs. That's gives me some hint that my original assumption that it's only polylogs, also for this integrals, makes sense. Okay. Now, let me jump over this. You can compute the residues just as we did for one loop. You will find two residues in this case. Well, there are two points where you can take a residue because you have more propagators, so you can put them on shell in different ways. There will be a piece like this and a piece like this. And these objects here are functions of weight six, which are constructed in exactly the same way as what I did here, but I would need to go to weight six. So there, you need a computer. Or you just go to the mass paper and you take the functions from there. Okay, so I cannot do that on the board. But when you do that, you write down an ansatz for this E, in terms of these functions, ah, and sorry, and another point, you see that here you have e and here you have e of 1 over x. That is precisely this a symmetry of this type. So the graph is actually, you see, is symmetric on the exchange of 2 and 4, which translates into the function being invariant under x goes to 1 over x, which means that actually this term and this term are the same up to inversion, because the residues are the same up to inversion. If I take this guy and I replace x by 1 over x, I get this guy. So this function must be the same as this up to inversion. Okay. And if you match it then to the asymptotic expansion, you get that there's a unique solution. I'm not going to show you what the L's are, but they are exactly defined in the same way. In particular, the L2 here is precisely uh, an L2 in here, and in L1 and L0. They are precisely the same objects as we have here on the board. Okay. So I can really get this three-loop integral without computing it. But what I needed is I needed a way, first of all, to know which kind of functions I could get. Here's something to make. How to construct the functions, the basis for the space of functions. And then also some physical input, how to get in the, uh, the asymptotics of the integral to fix the coefficients in front of the basis of, of functions. Okay? But I didn't compute any integral. So let's try to do the same for the other integral. There you see, when you compute the residues, there are two terms. One is x, one is x bar squared. The other one is like this. Note that this means it's h a. It's even on the exchange of x and x bar, while hb is odd. Okay, this, this factor here is even, and this one is odd. And so you play the same game. You write down an answer in terms of the functions that mathematicians classified as single valid HBLs. And, ah, this doesn't work. In any case, you find nothing. It doesn't work. So here's some, my original assumption was actually wrong. Now, at that point, you need to have some divine inspiration, unfortunately. Because I built the whole thing by saying, OK, let's build a space of functions out of this alphabet that I took from nowhere. Just, I, just, I was just guided by the lower loops that I knew. But it fails. I cannot find any in that space that I started with. I cannot find any function of this type that matches the asymptotics when these two points become very close. Now, you can play and say, OK, let's add x minus x bar. Why x minus x bar? Well, because it appeared everywhere and because it has nice transformation properties under, under this symmetry. 
and also under the exchange of x next bar. And now, well, and unfortunately now, mathematicians have not solved the problem for me. Now I have to construct the functions myself. Okay? But I can still do it. I can still do it the way I did it here at weight two. But I have to do it after weight six. Okay? It hurts a bit. It can be done. And now you, for example, at weight three, you will find objects that look like that. You will find all the functions that I had here. Okay? All these functions that I had before, I will find them as a subalgebra because my alphabet contains as a subset here the other one, which means that my function space will contain a subalgebra that has precisely the, well, it's the functions that I had before. But I will find new functions, like at weight 3, I find this object. And there I find things like that. And you see, now I have functions that actually couple, but this x and x bar, which is written as z, that couple x and x bar in the same function. That's what gives me x minus x bar. Okay? And you just solve it. You get the asymptotics of these objects, and you find the answer. Okay? For, I'm not going to show it was that long. It takes several pages. But you can write down the answer. But it's, it's multiple. You see, already at weight 3, I have this guy. This guy, I could write it in terms of D3 of something else. But if you find something like this at weight 3, at weight 4, you find similar objects, and those you cannot get rid of anymore. Those will not be D4, uh, but they will be genuine Gs. And they're there. So the assumption that it is polylogs of uniform weight was true, the assumption that it's only Singularity is at zero, and that one was wrong. But I can fix it by uh, including just one more letter. You can even go to four loops, and there, well, we did not do all the integrals, but some. You need even other letters. You need things like one minus x, x bar. But again, those you cannot, there's no way to get those at, at this moment. Either you have an inspiration and you find the right letters, or you don't. No, this, I mean, the fact that I included this guy means that the function has singularities on the locus x equals x bar. Which one? Here. I don't understand the question. They are worse than what? Can you, maybe can you? Uh, no, no, but these are uh, logarithmic functions. They have log singularities. They have no poles. No, no, no. So the, thing, the function is, is, the correlator has two pieces. The correlator has always a piece which is a rational prefactor times a function which is transcendental. So the H's will be linear combinations of polylogs, including... Yeah. Um, in this case, the function Q3 is because it's anti-symmetric. That one is because you see it's actually a difference of the two. So it, it has many, it's, yeah, you really have to look at the case at hand. In some cases it might not be, you're right, but in, in this case it even is. Okay. Are there questions? Uh, haven't these functions like G also classified by the mathematicians? No. They have just Lee with several links. No, but here I, I need um, single valued versions of them. Yeah. Those are not classified, but at least not published. Okay. I know that um, Oliver Schnetz has them, but he hasn't published them. He confirmed that he found the same basis as I did. But he did, he has 
the full thing when the alphabet is anything linear in Z and Z bar, mm -hmm. but he did not publish it. Okay. Are there questions? Yeah, how much time do we have left? Because we started a bit late, I think. 20 minutes. Okay. No questions? Let's look at another example, which is similar. Okay. The spirit is the same. You try to actually find a space of functions, write down the non-sets, and constrain by physical input. And the other example is the six-point MHV amplitude in n equals for super young ones. So if you don't know what MHV means, it doesn't matter. It's some six-point amplitude. You can also equivalently think of it as a Wilson loop. I won't have time to discuss that, but I can just state it that in n equals for super planar, n equals for super young wells, roughly speaking, in quotation marks, a scattering amplitude is equal to a Wilson loop. In which Wilson loop? Well, here you have, say, at six points, you have six light like vectors that come out. Okay? This will be equal, in quotation marks, to some Wilson loop along a light like polygon, where the polygon is obtained by just putting these vectors one after the other. And momentum conservation tells me that, indeed, the sum must be zero, so the polygon closes. And these axes you see here are just the coordinates here. Okay. And so on. These axes. Okay. And by conformal invariance, again, this thing can only be a function of cost ratios. I have to subtract some anomaly, but roughly speaking, this Wilson loop here will be a function only of three cost ratios. Okay. Now, the first thing, you can compute this thing at two loops. One loop is trivial. If you do it brute force, you get 17 pages. If you then look for something, the function that is similar, or the same, you find that 17 pages are equal to this. Okay. It was actually the first time that someone used the symbol in physics. So 17 pages collapse to this. Think of it as one big functional equation that tells you 17 pages is equal to this. That's one big function equation. Okay. It's not a place where functional equations come in. You can simplify and massage your expressions. But the main message, actually I want to pass, is that you see here, this is function L4, which has an expression, which is whatever it is. It's some polylogs of weight 4 because of my two loops. But the arguments of these things are these x plus and minuses, which are actually complicated things to square roots. Okay? So that tells you that my alphabet, when I go to the symbol, is actually not trivial. It's not just the cross ratios, but it's complicated functions of them. You can look what appears in the symbol. Actually, you observe that it's only nine different objects. Well, the number is not in the variant, okay? It depends on the parameterization. But if you choose a good parameterization, where you have the three cross ratios, one minus the cross ratios, and these y's are I write it here. Yi is u minus zi xi plus divided by u. We have ui minus xi minus, where the xi's are precisely the ones here. Okay, so the y's that appear in the symbol are constructed out of the, the axis that you see here. Okay, there are ratios of them, roughly. Okay? Now, now you can ask the same question. Can I actually go? and use that knowledge 
we go to higher loops. By saying, okay, let me assume, and again, it's an assumption, that even in the higher loops, the symbol will only contain these objects. So first of all, that means I assume it's only polylogs, even at higher loops. I assume also it's of uniform weight. So these are assumptions that I put in. And I assume that the answers in the symbol are just this. OK. And then I proceed in the same way. OK. Of course, I have to, again, impose that I write down the most general thing. And three loops, that would be weight six. This would be nine to the six possible terms I can write down. I have to impose that each thing is a function, just like I did there. Actually, physics tells me that this thing is a completely symmetric function of u, v, and w. So that's the equivalent of the H3 symmetry that I had before. I have to impose that my functions will be symmetric. This is what's called invariance and a parity. That's the equivalent of the exchange of x and x bar that I had before. That would here be the exchange of x plus and x minus, okay? If I only have two square roots, so you have to impose that the thing is actually real. So it must be invariant under this exchange of x and x bar, which is the same as inverting the y's. The exchange in x plus and x minus is inverting the y. And then you have to put in some physics input. For example, this function must vanish whenever actually these two, two consecutive sides become collinear. That's physics. I can also impose the first anti-condition. That's the rice cuts. There are some other constraints on the second and last entry. I'm going to discuss those. But then there's other input that I can use. There's an OPE that tells me so I said the function must vanish when two consecutive sides become collinear. But actually, there's an OPE expansion around being collinear. Okay? And so I actually must impose that my ansatz agrees with the prediction from this OPE. In the same way, there's something about, it's called the Reggie limit. Think of it as very high energy scattering. Okay? And I have to impose that my function has the right properties. So let me just spend this one slide each on these two physical constraints. So the regular limit tells me that the function I'm looking for, which is denoted here in this way, it doesn't matter, is actually in the limit where the two cost ratios become small and another one is close to one at fixed ratios and, which is not in the slide, on the different Riemann sheet. So it's very technical. But in any case, there's a prediction for what the, lead, for the behavior of the function close to this point is. It's given by this. Okay, this is a Fourier sum. This is kind of a Mellon transform of something. And the something is, well, the Ws here, they are essentially just my kinematical variables. And then you have a phi reg and an omega which are called the BFKI eigenvalue and the impact factor, never mind the names. But they are given, they come from, you can compute them from integrability. So you actually know this formula here to any loop order. Okay? So if I go to three, four, five loops, I can impose that the function that I pulled out of nothing, that I constructed, is consistent with the prediction from integrability. Okay? In the same way, I said there's an way when these things become collinear, there's an OPE that tells you how, what happens close to this collinear limit. For example, at six points, the way it works, just in a nutshell, is that every, the hexagon, I can see there's a tessellation of two pentagons when they intersect in a square. And that corresponds essentially to a state being created down here, traveling up, and being annihilated down up here. There's a flux tube which is sourced by these two lines. 
and you're actually exchanging the states of this flux tube. So this means that actually this thing is a probability to create a state psi out of the vacuum down here. It propagates freely up. And then there's a probability for this, this thing to be reabsorbed into the vacuum. Okay. And it turns out that, well, this tau sigma and m are just, well, this is the energy of the state, momentum of the state, the angular momentum, and these are tau is essentially here the time it travels roughly. And we can check that this thing becoming flat corresponds to large tau. So in tau to infinity, you flatten the thing. And if you flatten the thing, then, well, you can expand in tau. And you see that that corresponds, for example, to the leading term is single particle exchange. Okay? And this is very technical. This would take a whole lecture just to win this. But roughly speaking, I know that when I'm very close to collinear here, so when this point goes down, there's a picture that tells me that there's a flux tube with a single particle exchange that describes what it is, the leading term. And again, the energy spectrum E here and this probability, at least conjecturally, you get it from integrability. So I know what happens when the function is such that this point goes down here. So I can impose that. I can also go deeper and have two particle exchanges and so on. Thing. Right now, not more is known than two particle exchange, as far as I know. And you do that, and well, at two loops, yeah, the function is computed exactly, but let's say I would do the same at two loops. I would start off with 75 free parameters if I just require that the thing is a function. Okay? In principle, I start off with 9 to the 4 parameters, 9 letters. In two loops, so wait for. After required that the thing is actually a function, I have 75. If I require this function to be symmetric, I have 23 parameters. If I require the function real, I get 18. If I require it, so this T here is essentially, this capital T is this e to the, e to the minus tau. Okay. Tau, large tau large corresponds to this T being very small. It's the order parameter. So, I said that the first term is zero. Let me go here. So, uh, the leading term in T vanishes. If I have to impose that, I have three, four free parameters. And, well, this is essentially the same as, well, this is OPE. If I impose it, then I get a unique function. I didn't even need all of the constraints. If you go to three loop, you start off with nine to the six parameters, or if you impose it's a function, roughly 650. Still, you find there's a unique answer. If you go to four loops, you start off with something like 6,003 parameters. So it's a function space of dimension 6,000. Still, after you impose all the constraints, there's a unique function in that space that can represent the scattering amplitude or dispersion. But it requires that they know how to construct the basis of the space. Okay? So I'm not going to show you the function because this function, I think, is at four loops is 60 megabytes. Okay? But you can get it and you can evaluate it numerically, you can plot it, you can study its, its properties, its limits, whatever you want. Okay? So I guess then I'm basically there. So th these are two examples of how you can use these techniques. The basic idea always being that you can construct a space of functions, essentially, and then bootstrap your way up. If someone tells you, I know that the type of functions is this, like for the correlate, it was x and x bar, 1 minus x, 1 minus x bar, you can construct all the functions you need up to a given loop order, if you assume it's polylogs and then try to impose physical constraints to build essentially a unique answer. Okay. 
And here's the example of, of the six points symmetry amplitude. It was also done at next symmetry. But again, the idea is the same. Someone tells you what the building blocks of the functions are, the alphabet and the symbol, and then you can really build up a space of functions to any loop order you like, and then use physical con constraints to fix the function. Okay? Are there questions? Last chance. Sorry, at the end of the story, uh, we must uh, calculate the uh, volume of the head level for obtaining the uh, scattering amplitude. I have to compute maybe, what? Maybe I'm not true. So I have to compute which volume? I mean, and at the end of the story, uh, we must uh, uh, calculate the volume of the head level. Which volume? Is it true? For, for scattering amplitude? Uh, I know I computed the volume. Okay. So I'm not sure which volume you mean. Maybe I'm not sure. Like, I, 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 at, at this point, there's no, I mean, I didn't talk about computing volumes. Maybe I missed the question, so we can talk about it later. Well, but yeah, by the normal dimensions, I will say zeta, so something like that, okay? Uh, a normal dimension, you thinking more of multiple zeta values, for example. You don't have functions, so there actually the, the whole thing is known. But then what would be the constraints that you can impose on this thing? If you have constraints that you can impose, maybe yes, yeah. Um, sorry? No, but, but for uh, anomalous dimensions, they are numbers, right? Sorry? Okay, but then you already have an expansion. It's not a non trivial function of some variable. Are there other questions? <coughs> no remarks? I don't see any, so let's see. Thank you very much again for your nice speech. Thank you.